it's very nice to have you all here today. I'm so excited to uh, get started on our European history class for today. Uh, let me talk a little bit about myself first. My name is Megan Bowman. Um, I am a history teacher. I've taught for 13 years uh, in a variety of settings and uh, uh, public school system and for homeschool co-ops. And I now teach and tutor exclusively online uh, for an online school for um, primarily American homeschooled students um, who are interested in uh, taking an AP class online. Um, but I have taught a number of different courses uh, throughout my 13 years of teaching. I've taught World History I, World History II, U.S. History, uh, AP U.S. History, AP World History, and AP European History. And uh, right now, I've uh, for the past five years, I've been teaching uh, exclusively online, and I teach um, three classes now. I teach AP, two sections of AP European history and one section of AP world history. Um, so I, I really love working with students who are eager to learn and who are um, who who love to read history and discuss history. Um, and uh, I, I myself have had a passion for history since I was a student. Um, I um, I want to make sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, good. Just making sure. Um, I um, I my my love of history started when I was uh, actually in college. Um, I, I started studying uh, American history, um, but I also had the opportunity to study abroad in Rome, Italy, at a university called John Cabot University, uh, which was an amazing experience. So I've traveled a bit as well, and. Um, and like I said, I just, I love history. I love reading history, but I love, uh, I love teaching history. I love talking about history with, with students, especially students who are interested in it. Um, so now I live, uh, like I said, I live uh, in West Virginia and I have um, a husband and three daughters and, um, and I, I'm really enjoying teaching online right now as it's uh, enabling me to also help homeschool my, my daughters who are uh, learning virtually as well. Um, so I am really excited to talk about our, our topic for today. Uh, like I said, I teach AP European and world history right now. And um, it's the time of the year, at least in, in the United States where students from this point forward are really gonna be working hard uh, over the next five months to prepare for exams, um, for the AP exams in order to earn college credit. So um, it's, uh, it's gonna be a, a really a, a concentrated, time in my classes over the next five months. But uh, this is kind of a treat for me because I get to just enjoy this and talk about the, the material that I, I'm interested in with you all. So thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to get started. Um, so we're going to be discussing, like, um, like Kay said, we're going to be discussing early European history today. Uh, and we're specifically looking at um, the making of medieval monarchies which I, I'm fascinated by uh, because I really enjoy um, thinking about what life looked like in Europe um, before we see the nation states and the nations that we know today in Europe, like England and France and Spain and Germany. Um, so let me make sure that we're good to go here. Um, yes, that's right. So can you all see my PowerPoint okay? Wonderful. Okay. Just want to make sure that you're not, um, that you guys can see and hear me okay. All right. So I'm going to do my best to um, mix my lecture with, um, with some video clips as well. Uh, and uh, here and there, I might ask you guys a question to see what you guys know. Um, I like to, uh, to also just start off, when you guys think of this time in European history, I don't know how many of you have taken a European history course before, but um, when you think of, you know, 1100 to 1250, you know, a lot of times students don't have a lot of background knowledge. You know, if, if I were to say World War II to you or, you know, the Roman Empire, you'd probably be able to throw something at me that, you know, shows that you've learned something about the Roman Empire or World War II. But when I when I tell people, OK, what about 1100 to 1250 A.D. in European history? People are kind of like, well, uh, are they feudal? Yeah. Medieval. OK, yeah, that's good. Is there anything else you could throw in the chat pod uh, when you're thinking about this time in, in history? 
Okay, for sure. We're going to start to see uh, the demand for, um, for, for goods like tea in Europe eventually. Yep. Feudalism is a big one. Yep. The Battle of Hastings. Yeah. Trade. Ottoman Empire. They're going to come in, into the story at some point too. Okay. We're going to see, yeah, we're going to see a push for precious metals, especially after the discovery of the new world. Uh, the discovery, I'm going to put that in quotes because it had certainly been discovered before Europeans arrived, but um, we'll see a big push of, for, for silver and gold. Uh, but yeah, good. I'm loving what I'm seeing. This is great. So yeah, one of the biggest things I think students normally say is uh, feudalism, that they, they remember um, <laughs> France is fighting going too much. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, we're gonna, what we're going to get to uh, hopefully in future classes is a discussion about uh, France and England, especially because they seem to be like two children who can never get along, like two siblings, you know, who are always fighting over something. So yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, war is oftentimes one of students' favorite things to discuss in history. Um, and and I, I agree with you. I really like military history. Hopefully I'll bring some of that out in this class too. So cool. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually uh, close the chat pod, but whenever I have a question, I'm going to open it back up um, so that you guys can, uh, can fire away some answers. All right. So we could, yeah, let's, let's fight. Let's go ahead and get started here. Okay. So we're going to start our discussion of European history. Like I said, between 1100 and 1250 AD or CE is another way that we, we use um, this period of time in history. But the big things to note about this time in history is that we're seeing the early formation of European nation states. They're not quite yet to the point of nation states, but we're seeing the beginning, um, you know, uh, I'll say um, ingredients, if you will. I don't know how many of you like to cook or bake. I love to, I love to bake uh, and cook, but just the beginning of the ingredients coming together in a mixing bowl, uh, thinking of things like what elements make for a strong government? What elements make for the beginning of a cultural England versus a cultural France versus a cultural Germany? We're gonna be seeing these things start to, to merge together during this time. And then also we're gonna see how, uh, how we come to have a monarchy uh, in these nation states as well. Why did they choose a monarchy and, and what that uh, process looked like, okay? So, Let's start with England. So we're gonna start by discussing the Norman Conquest. So the Norman Conquest of England in 1066 AD brought with it the concept of feudalism. William the Conqueror, who lived from 1027 to 1087 AD, helped to centralize feudalism by spreading the notion that all landowners owed loyalty to the king. Now, real quick, I need to start us off by making sure we're all on the same page here. Um, in case you need a quick review, feudalism was a system that dominated much of Europe, going all the way back to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Does anyone have any idea what century the Roman Empire collapsed? If you just throw a number out there, anyone have any idea? Okay, the fifth century. Yeah, so roughly 476 AD or CE, okay, is when the Roman Empire had collapsed. And oftentimes what we see, and I, I'm going to show you a short video clip in a moment about what feudalism is, but um, oftentimes we see, and this is all throughout world history, uh, whenever there's a time of, of terror, of terrorism in, um, in a region, people oftentimes leave cities, okay, and they move to, normally they move to higher ground and they move to uh, the, the land, the, an area where, where they um, are closest to someone with an army, okay? What I'm describing here is when the Roman empire collapsed, it was being invaded by all these different groups of people, okay? Um, we call them, you know, like the Huns, for example, would be um, a group that had invaded um, ultimately, uh, part of what had been uh, the Roman Empire, um, but the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, these, these were some of the other groups. And because people were terrified of losing their lives, they left the cities, hunkered down next to the person who had an, an army. And this is 
why we see feudalism beginning here. You have, you know, the wealthy landowners, the lords who own, you know, the castle and the estate, and then they, they have their own personal army. Those are the knights, right? And then they have everyone else who's hunkering down on their land, uh, their peasants, uh, for fear of their own lives. Okay, that's kind of what began the feudal period in Europe. So um, let me turn us real quick. This is going to be a quick review, hopefully, for those of you who don't know what feudalism is. Um, but let me turn us real quick to this short video, and then we'll keep going with our discussion on England, because it's important that you guys have a running idea of what the feudal system looked like. Okay, so I'm going to share this with you just for a moment. Let me make sure that I have my volume on one second here. It didn't work, hold on. Yes, okay, it should work now. All right, so quick review of feudalism. Feudalism is a term invented in the 19th century to describe how society was structured during the high Middle Ages. That's between 1000 and 1300 AD. The feudal system was based on the exchange of land and services. Under the feudal system, all the land in the kingdom belonged to the king. He would then parcel out large estates to great lords known as tenants-in-chief in exchange for their military and political support. These great lords then parceled out smaller portions of the land to lesser lords on similar terms, who did the same to local lords, who did the same to peasants. The feudal system had its own vocabulary. A king or lord who gave land to a lesser lord became the latter's overlord. The person receiving the land became the vassal of the person who granted it, and the land itself was called a fight. Necessarily a minor figure. Everyone in the feudal system below the king was a vassal, even the greatest lords in the land. Even the King of England was a vassal to the King of France for the lands he had inherited there. By the later Middle Ages, though, feudalism had largely disappeared from Europe. This was the result of a number of factors. Firstly, medieval kings grew less reliant on their great lords to provide soldiers for their armies, turning instead to professional paid soldiers. This weakened the bonds of feudalism built on the obligation to provide military service. Secondly, the Black Death, which arrived in England in 1348, significantly reduced the population available to work the land. Those who were lucky enough to survive the epidemic had increased bargaining power and could increasingly choose where they worked and demand higher wages. This meant that the nobility gradually lost their control over the lower and middling ranks in society, who could now afford to buy their own land. Finally, increasing urbanization and a greater reliance on a money economy rather than a land economy also contributed to the decline of feudalism. So to recap, the great lords were no longer expected to provide military service to the king, the peasants were increasingly free to live and work where they wanted, and money replaced manpower as the key agent of economic and political power. Whilst feudalism declined in England from the 14th century onwards, it was not formally abolished until the Ten Years Abolition Act of 1660. Okay, I'm going to stop it there because, um, as you heard, he went a little bit beyond uh, where we are at this point in history, which is fine because um, it gives you a good idea of what's going to happen with feudalism down the down the road. Um, but I wanted you guys to make. I wanted to make sure you guys were on the same page in terms of what feudalism looked like, in terms of the different social obligations that existed between the lord, the vassals, the knights, and the peasants. Okay, and why feudalism began in the first place. When you think of that, think of the collapse of the Roman Empire. Think of times in history when there are terror groups coming through and attacking and pillaging and burning and you know looking for riches. Um, people are going to move out of the cities, hunker down next to someone who has an army at their disposal who can protect them. Okay. Okay. So can you guys see the PowerPoint again? I hope. Make sure here. I think you can, but I just want to make sure. Okay, great. All right. So if I have the chat pot up like that, am I blocking the image on the PowerPoint for you guys? If so, I'll just take it down until I have a question. It's not blocking the PowerPoint? Okay, all right, great. 
Okay, so we're, we're back to England. The Norman conquest of England in 1066 brought with it the concept of feudalism. William the Conqueror, who lived from 1027 to 1087, helped to centralize feudalism by spreading the notion that all landowners owed loyalty to the king. Okay, the king is at the very top of the social class pyramid in a feudal system. Okay, the king and then the local lords, the wealthy nobles who own castles and land, and then they have people under them and knights and then the peasants at the bottom. Um, by the time of King Henry I, the rise of an administrative kingship was fully underway in England. King Henry did this in a number of different ways. He strengthened his local administration. One of the ways he did this was through the creation of something called the Clerks of Exchequer, okay? Basically, these were people they were who worked in an offshoot of the treasury, um, and they lived separate from the king's household. Uh, actually, they settled in a place called Westminster, and um, they would just help the king manage revenue coming in and accounts to make sure that everything was on the up and up. OK, um, also under King Henry I, uh, the idea of traveling circuit judges were instituted. Um, basically, what that refers to is it's the practice of having judges who oversee, you know, criminal and uh, court cases of any kind. Before this point, people had to go to London to have their, their cases heard by judges. But these traveling circuit court judges would literally ride around the countryside each year on preset paths circuits to hear cases so that people didn't have to leave their land and their work to go travel all the way to London, which was a very expensive trip for people to make. Um, so you can see ways in which the king is um, organizing his authority with a larger bureaucracy, you know, kind of a financial group to oversee finances and now judicial as well. And then we have King Henry. The, so that was King Henry the first. Then we have King Henry the second. Uh, who ruled from 1133 to 1189. He ruled over a number of different provinces, including Normandy in France, Anjou, Maine, and Aquitaine. He actually was married to Eleanor of Aquitaine. Sometimes people who aren't as familiar with this time in history at least recognize her name, uh, Aquitaine being, of course, a province of France. And uh, so his marriage to her actually helped uh, kind of integrate the British Isles, which were separate, you know, separated by a body of water from the continent of Europe, kind of brought them together through that marriage a little bit. Um, he's responsible for the origins of the modern legal system. This is King Henry II. He ordered juries of local men who were tasked with reporting under oath any violation of the law, uh, which, you know, that might seem, okay, what, why is that important? This actually made it easier for common people to seek justice, okay? Uh, additionally, he tried to reform the operation of church courts. He attempted to claim jurisdiction over the clergy of the church, and he used royal courts for sentencing, and he declared a common English law as well. Then we get to the story of Thomas Becket. Thomas Becket was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Again, a lot of students who aren't as familiar with this time period at least have heard his name or they've heard of the position of Archbishop of Canterbury. If you haven't, that's basically uh, the senior bishop position over the Church of England. So it's like the top person over the Church of England. The, he's still answerable to the king, but still he's got the, top, the highest, most powerful position in the church. Anyway, I wanted to share a little bit about his story uh, with you briefly. So I'm going to um, turn our attention over to another short, quick video about Thomas Beckett. It'll be short. Um, I'm not gonna spend time going through his early life with you because really for our purposes, I just wanna share his story with you because it's very intriguing and uh, and and students oftentimes find it um, kind of creepy. All right, so we're kind of in the middle of his biography here. I'm hoping you guys can see this okay. Pull up the chat to make sure that you can. You guys can see this? I'm always paranoid that I'm going to start pressing play and uh, people aren't going to be able to see. I'm assuming you can. Okay. 
On the 18th of April 1161, Theobald of Beck died and Thomas Becket was nominated as his successor. His election to the post was confirmed on the 23rd of May 1162 by a royal council which consisted of bishops and noblemen and he was ordained as a priest ten days later. The next day, the 3rd of June 1162, Henry of Blois, the Bishop of Winchester, and the other bishops of Canterbury consecrated him as Archbishop. Problems started to develop almost immediately between the new Archbishop and the King. Henry had hoped that Thomas would continue to put the royal government first, but this didn't happen. Thomas resigned as Chancellor and started to seek to recover the rights of the Archbishopric. The king began attempts to gain favour with the other bishops and sway them against Thomas in Westminster in October of 1163. The king was seeking approval of the rights of the royal government over the church and also wanted weak connections with Rome. Becket was asked to agree to the king's rights, but even in the face of political repercussions, Thomas, although signalling an agreement with the essence of what the king wanted, refused to sign the documents, which are known as the Constitutions of Clarendon, named after the place where they were drawn up and signed, Clarendon Palace. Becket was accused by the king of contempt of royal authority and was summoned to a great council at Northampton Castle on the 8th of October 1164. When he was found guilty, Thomas stormed out of the proceedings and fled to France, where King Louis VII had offered him protection. He spent nearly two years in a Cistercian abbey in Pontigny, but had to leave when Henry threatened the order. Thomas attempted to retaliate by excommunicating the king, but at this point the Pope intervened. Papal legates were sent to act as arbitrators in 1167, but it took until 1170 for a compromise to be reached that would allow Thomas to return to England. The trouble wasn't over, though. In York in June 1170, Henry the Young King, son of Henry II, was crowned by the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London and the Bishop of Salisbury, thus breaching Canterbury's privilege of coronation. In November of the same year, all three were excommunicated by Becket. The three clergymen fled to Normandy and reported to King Henry II what had happened. There is much dispute over what Henry said, with one common quote being, Who will rid me of this troublesome priest? Whatever was said, it was interpreted by a group of knights as an order to kill Becket. On the 29th of December 1170, four knights, Reginald Fitzurse, Hugh de Morville, William de Tracy and Richard Le Breton, arrived in Canterbury and placed their weapons under a tree before hiding their mail armour under their cloaks and entering the cathedral. The knights challenged Becket to submit to the king's will, but he refused. The knights retrieved their weapons from outside and rushed back into the cathedral and attacked Becket with their swords, inflicting mortal wounds to his head. He died close to where the monks were chanting. Most biographies would end with the death of the subject, but Thomas Becket's story does not end there. Soon after his death, he began to be venerated as a martyr, and so on the 21st of February 1173, Thomas Becket was canonised by Pope Alexander III in St Peter's Church in Seigny. Becket's assassins were sent by the Pope to serve as knights in the Holy Land for 14 years as penance, and even King Henry II himself gave public penance at Becket's tomb on the 12th of July 1174. Okay, so an interesting story about Thomas Beckett. Um, Oh, I'm sorry if the video was behind. Hopefully you got most of that. Um, But can someone tell me real quick in the chat, what what does the term martyr mean? It was mentioned in the uh, video. Okay. Yeah, a person, it normally refers uh, in a religious context to someone who dies for their religious beliefs. Um, So in this case, you know, Thomas Beckett, I believe, felt that he had um, religious differences with the king. Uh, And um, in this case, that is one of the reasons why the Pope declared him a martyr. 
a uh, few years after his death. Yeah, so sacrifice. Yes, exactly. Good. Okay, so the story goes on. Thomas Beckett obviously uh, was um, uh, was killed and then um, declared a martyr by the Pope. And um, you can actually see his story here in the slide. Hopefully by now you guys can see the slide all right. Um, let me just make sure I'm in my right place here. Excuse me one second. Uh, yeah, in this illumination from a 13th century prayer book, one of the knights has struck the archbishop so violently that he has broken his sword. Um, so this is uh, definitely a, uh, a sign. The fact that this became a prayer book in the 1200s shows you the fact that Beckett was declared a martyr. Um, it's, you know, the, the image on the front is what the faithful supposedly were supposed to see when they went to pray. After the reign of Henry II was Richard the Lionheart. And Richard spent all but six month, months of his reign on crusade. So we're going to actually talk about the crusades in a little bit here. But now we need to get to something that's very, very important to know. Uh, this is the, um, the Magna Carta. So King John, uh, King John's reign proved he was less than a capable military leader compared to his predecessor, King Richard the Lionheart, who, who reigned before him. I want to make sure you guys are seeing this okay. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, most people have heard of Richard, Richard the Lionheart. Good. So um, King John lost nearly all Angevin lands and devoted the majority of his reign to raising money in order to regain French territory. During John's reign, feudal rights were pressed to their limits. He fined the nobility for infractions and he heavily taxed the country. It was during his reign that the Magna Carta was born. In 1215 AD, John's barons forced him to agree to a great charter. The Magna Carta defined the rights of barons while limiting the rights of the king. This created a new concept in governance, the idea that the king was bound by law. Before the signing of the Magna Carta, kings were completely above the law. It was this idea of the divine right of kings. Uh, most people felt that God had chosen the king to rule or queen in some cases. And therefore, because God was the one who chose the king, no one could question the king or queen's authority. That was a belief at the time. So the fact that King John was forced to sign this document, limiting his power was a huge step um, for this time in history. So um, the Magna Carta also stated taxation could not be raised by the crown without the consent of the kingdom. It gave rights to anyone accused of a crime. This was the beginning of the notion of habeas corpus, which came a few hundred uh, years later. Anyone know what habeas corpus is? What is the right of habeas corpus? Yes. No worries if no one knows, I can define it. Basically, habeas corpus states that, well, it, the word body is in there, to have a body is what it means. It basically states that um, no one can be imprisoned without being charged with a crime. One simply cannot throw someone else in jail and hold them there without cause, without having what, what we would say a body of evidence against them, some sort of evidence saying that they are guilty. Um, so that, that, you know, that's good. You don't want to be thrown in jail and not have any rights at all. You want to be, you want to know why you're being held in jail, right? But the greatest reform the Magna Carta gave was the formation of parliament. Parliament being a representative body of barons, of lords, who spoke on behalf of the people. Parliament gradually became a consultative, financial, judicial, and legislative body similar to the United States Congress. The institution of Parliament also brought the emergence of a new type of government. And this is very important, a constitutional monarchy. So, up to this point in history, absolutism was the order of the day. Absolutism was the idea, again, like I said a moment ago, that a king rules with absolute power and no limits on that power. So this is the beginning of the end for absolutism, at least in England. Uh, this is going to transform forever uh, the king's, you know, 
uh, blank check of power uh, with the signing of the Magna Carta. But that's really just in England for now. More on that to come. Let's move over to France briefly. <laughs> that's funny, yes, yeah. So in France, the monarchy still enlisted feudalism as its means for governance. By now you guys know feudalism. I'm sure you knew it up to this point, but by now you've, you've had that review. So um, centralization of the government in France was slower than in England and faced greater problems. Uh, the ruler Charlemagne, I don't know how many of you have heard of the ruler Charlemagne, um, his earlier institutions collapsed leading to the rise of a new dynasty in France, the Capetian dynasty, which ruled from 987 to 1328 AD. This dynasty was marked by few land claims and an ever increasing income from agriculture and trade. Politicians in the system were known for being shrewd. With the rise of Philip Augustus, royal power in France grew. Philip decided to reinvent the French kingdom by taking direct control over Normandy and the nearby Angevin territories. Who had ruled Normandy and Angevin up to this point? You guys remember from the previous slides? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's true. France is going to be absolute for quite some time. Actually, the, but the Vikings would attack the, those regions for sure, but England, England had uh, Normandy and Angevin territories. Now, this guy Philip, the ruler of France, is going to retake those lands, okay, which is going to be an issue for France down the road. But Philip developed an effective system of local administration by superimposing new royal officials called bailli over local government. And it's a French word, so it doesn't it's not pronounced at all the way that it looks. Here's what it, how it's spelled in the chat pod, but it's pronounced Bayi. Bayi had full judicial, administrative, and military authority. And although Bayi were afforded much independence and power, their position was contingent on promising full loyalty to the king. And then King Louis IX uh, was the next ruler. He extended administrative patterns and represented the epitome of 13th century kingship. Um, France did have a parlement, kind of like England's parliament, but it wasn't nearly as powerful as England. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is the nobility, the, the rich landowning class in France, are going to mostly be ex exempt from paying taxes, which is also going to come back to hurt France down the road. And then one quick thing, I love discussing architecture, so I'm just going to take a moment to show you uh, these two beautiful churches. Um, so we can see here in these two churches, um, the Romanesque and Gothic styles, okay? Both of these churches were dedicated to the Virgin Mary and built within a century of one another. So the one on the left is the west front of the church of Notre Dame de uh, la Grande and Poitiers, which was the ancestral domain of Eleanor of Aquitaine. You, you will call, she was married to Henry II. Um, and it was constructed between 1135 and 1145. And you, you'll, you'll see some of the round arches, strong stone walls, massive supporting pillars, small windows. Um, and then the one on the right is the Cathedral of Notre Dame at Reims in Champagne, built between 1212 and 1299. And for this church, the biggest thing that I always see, besides things like the, the um, vertical lines and the gable portals, pointed arches, the biggest thing I always see when I look at that church is what? What, what does your eye, what is your eye drawn to when you first look at that church on the right? Yes, they are. The middle, yeah, the middle, the enormous rose window, uh, which flood the vast interior with beautiful colored light. Okay, let's move quickly now. We're going to speed up a bit here to make sure we get more in to Germany. So in Germany, we had a ruler by the name of Frederick II. He was also known as Barbarossa. He ruled from 1152 to 1190, and he called his realm the Holy Roman Empire. This is going to be hugely important for European history from this point forward. The general consensus was his Holy Roman Empire was a universal empire blessed by God. 
he attempted to rule with the cooperation of German princes. So one thing to note is that Germany is not necessarily its own nation yet. It's the Holy Roman Empire. It includes quite a lot of territory. If you look at the slide here in yellow is all the Holy Roman Empire. Um, but it's still divided up among local rulers, German princes. So keep that in mind. It's going to be quite a while before Germany is its own united country. So anyway, uh, Frederick, the, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, attempted to rule in cooperation with those local German princes I just told you about. He also attempted to exert power in northern Italy, which led to struggles with the Pope. Keep in mind, Europe is largely Catholic at this point in history, okay? The, the Catholic Church, Catholic meaning universal, the United Church. Um, and so, you know, the Pope is the head of that Catholic Church. So the Pope tries for much of European history to exercise a great deal of authority over the secular rulers, secular meaning separate from, from religious institutions. Um, and so there's going to be constant conflict between the local king or the, the rulers of Europe and the Pope. Keep that in mind too. Uh, so anyway, this uh, struggle uh, with the Pope led to the formation of something called the Lombard League which was a compromise to acknowledge the sovereignty of the papal states, meaning they could rule themselves. They were not answerable to the Holy Roman Emperor. Okay. Pictured here on the slide, maybe you've seen it before, is uh, Neuschwanstein Castle. It's one of the more famous castles in Germany. Beautiful uh, backdrop um, as well. If you like Disney movies, the, the castle that you see at the beginning of a Disney movie is based on the design of this castle in Germany. Fun little fact for you there. And then on the slide here, you see this beautifully illuminated manuscript of Frederick II's famous treatise on falconry, which was commissioned by his son Manfred shortly after his father's death in 1250. It's now in the Vatican Library in Rome. Pretty cool. I don't know if anyone is interested in falconry as a sport, uh, training falcons, but super cool. All right, then we get to Spain. Spain was highly regionalized during this period. Six, the successful reconquest of the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula of Spain, was executed by the Muslims. This reconquest was viewed as a holy war in the viewpoint of the Christians, which resulted in the Crusades against the Muslims. There were four major Christian kingdoms in Spain, Navarre, Port Portugal, the combined kingdom of Aragon and Catalonia and Castile. Alfonso II of Aragon was the first to rule a united kingdom of Aragon. And during his reign, the big book of fiefs was developed. This record book, so to speak, kept track of property transactions and family lineages, uh, which is important if you think about, you know, all over Europe, uh, the nobles were very um, you know, obsessed with maintaining their noble status, their wealth, their land, their, you know, fancy mansion. And so having records of family lineages was really important to them because it meant that their, the, the, their dynasty, their, their, their sons, their grandsons, their great grandsons and so forth would continue to own that land and have that noble title. Um, in addition, this record book also was kept uh, so that people would have written records in order to legitimize authority, especially for the ruling family. And then the region of Castile, you can see pictured on the map here, emerged in the 13th century as the largest kingdom. By that time, Aragon was urbanized and commercially connected, meaning there were cities popping up throughout this region, uh, especially along the coast that grew up as um, kind of trading posts. Um, the marriage of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile unified the Spanish monarchy. Once unified, the kingdom had the means to unite the armies and capture Granada. Also, this unification gave the kingdom the funds to send Christopher Columbus west on his exploration for a route to the east. And then this is a beautiful picture as well um, of Lori Castle in Aragon, the province of Aragon. So no single photograph can capture the size or setting of this massive castle uh, in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. 
It was initially fortified in the 11th century as a base for Christian expansion into Muslim territory, and then it was further enlarged in the 12th century. The encircling wall you can see in the, in the picture here and towers were added in the 13th and 14th centuries. I don't know. I don't, I don't I actually don't think so, but that's a really good question. Oh, based on, you know, I, I actually wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Something to Google later, right? Something to look up. Okay, now we're going to move east. We So far, we've kind of been in Western Europe. Let's move to Eastern Europe briefly. So Eastern Europe, so um, the large open spaces of Eastern Europe provided a haven for peasants who sought to escape the system of feudalism. Local nobles wishing to adopt the lifestyles of their Western European counterparts, the, the nobles in the West, were able to attract peasant migrants with the promise of greater freedoms than they had had in the West. And then farther to the East, we moved to the vast lands of Russia, which served as the border between Europe and the steppes of Afro-Eurasia. Does anyone know that geographic term? What does, what, what, what are we referring to when we say the steppes? <laughs> That's right. The steps basically, yeah, you're thinking of, of the right area. Um, they're referring to kind of the grassy plains um, in, uh, let me find my, uh, sorry, I just lost my place real quick. There we go, the steps of Afro-Eurasia. So kind of, yeah, that norm, that um, kind of central area where we see a lot of um, nomadic or um, kind of pastoral groups groups of people who instead of like settling and you know building cities and things like that, they were semi-nomadic and they normally had um, herds of cattle or herds of horses uh, or sheep that they um, grazed on these grassy plains. And because you know you can't stay in one place for very long because the animals are gonna eat all the grass, they move around to find grassier lands. And so um, you're thinking of the Mongols and that's good that you are because they're gonna come into the story soon. And that's where they originated. Um, at any rate, uh, Russia served as kind of the border between Europe and the steppes where those pa semi-nomadic pastoral groups lived, okay? <laughs> you guys with me so far? I hope, I hope. All right, uh, we're doing good. Stick with me here. We're, we're uh, this will pick up speed a little bit here. So um, anyway, what you need to know about Russia is that it, um, it's kind of started early on around a city called Kiev. Kiev emerged, it was a small fishing village and it was located on something called the Dnieper River. And the Dnieper River was significant because it fed down into the Black Sea. Um, so Russia is going to emerge um, surrounded by the city of Kiev as a commercial crossroads that looks southward to, southward to Byzantium for religious, political, and cultural inspiration. You might not have heard of Byzantium, but you need to remember Byzantium is going to be the capital city of the Byzantine Empire. Um, real quick review, the Roman Empire we talked about earlier fell in 476, right? But that was kind of the Western part of Europe, but the Eastern part of Europe didn't really fall as badly. In fact, they kind of had a golden age. Uh, they kind of called themselves the Roman Empire part two, and this was the Byzantine Empire. Um, the capital was moved by uh, Constantine from Rome to Byzantium. And of course he was a very humble guy. So he renamed the city Constantinople. Uh, it's not going to stay that that name forever because eventually it will be conquered by another group and renamed again. But the reason I mention this is because the Byzantine Empire was thriving. It was doing really, really well. And it's going to influence the development of Russia through trade, okay? Because of that Dnieper River that goes north and, uh, you know, they can ship goods north and south. That's going to have the biggest influence on the development of Russia, okay? Cool, all right, so um, a little bit more about um, Russia. The historical development of Russia as told by something called the Primary Chronicle, 
which was an ancient Russian history, is fascinating and helps to explain why the Russian lands were so attractive to both the Mongols in the East and the Europeans in the West. Before the Mongols arrived, the lands of Russia were politically and military organized with a central government authority. Economically, there were clear-cut trade routes, clear foreign policies, a distinct class system, and an advancement in agricultural ventures. So what I'm referring to is the beginning of that Kievan state that sur was surrounding that city of Kiev, okay? Um, I'm going to move ahead here because it's important to understand that Kiev had strong trade ties, extensive commercial trade routes, agricultural tributes, and merchant tariffs. Um, some of the goods coming in and out of Kiev, for example, included honey, fur, wax, transport boats, all of this led to, towards successful trade markets. Um, and these successful commercial endeavors led to the wide use of coinage over the barter system. And if you're not familiar, the barter system is oftentimes used during the feudal period it was used. Um, barter literally meaning trade, right? So like if you're sitting in school and you're trying to barter part of your lunch for your friend's lunch, you know, it might work if you both agree on the intrinsic value of what you're trying to trade. But, you know, when I was in elementary school, I was never able to trade my like, I don't know, my carrot sticks for my friend's chocolate chip cookies, right? I don't know. I, maybe you don't like either of those, but didn't work out, right? My friend was like, no, I'm not giving you my chocolate chip cookies because we couldn't agree that carrots were a good trade for chocolate chip cookies. So you can see the issue with the barter system. It only works when both parties agree on the trade and that can slow things down. The barter system can work for smaller groups of people. But take, for example, you know, the lunch table, you and your friend might be able to do that, okay, and have time to eat your lunch and then go back to class. But if the whole lunchroom suddenly has to barter for their lunch, it's gonna take too long. You're not gonna eat anything by the time you have to get back to class. So as soon as the population is uh, greater, oftentimes we see in civilization, people move from a barter economy to a, a, a money-based economy, okay? Whatever that money might, currency might look like. In this case, in Russia, it was based on coins, okay? All right, so um, let's see here. We're moving on to, um, it's important to understand that the Kievan state uh, was thriving. It had boats for trade. It had, um, uh, let's see, just trying to skip ahead a little bit here. Um, you know, it was doing well. Eventually it is going to become weaker. Uh, which will set the stage for the uh, invasion of the Mongols, which hopefully we'll talk about in our next webinar. Um, but it's also important to understand one more thing about the Kievan state that I want you to, to make sure you remember. I'm going to skip ahead here, is the influence of Christianity, okay? Um, remember how I said the Byzantine Empire came to have a huge influence over the development of Russia, of the Kievan state in Russia? Christianity is going to be what is brought from the Byzantine Empire, specifically uh, the, the Byzantine, the Eastern Orthodox version of Christianity, which was different from the Roman Catholic uh, Christianity. I'm not going to get into why those two uh, split from the original Catholic Church, but it is important to understand that that is what is going to influence Russia's religious development, which is why they are more, their Russian Orthodox Church is more similar to the Greek Orthodox Church than it is to the Roman Catholic Church even today, okay? All right, now let's get on to a more exciting topic here, shall we? One of the things I like to talk about is the Crusades. So um, let me go ahead and dive in here. Um, Okay, so papal dominion and canon law expanded as European kingdoms were consolidated as they came together. Um, let's see. Since the Byzantine Empire, I'm going to skip ahead. Since the Byzantine Empire co complicated political and religious atmospheres due to its location in the Mediterranean, tensions rose um, between Christian Europe and uh, the Muslim world, okay? So um, initially, the Crusades could be broadly interpreted to include enemies of Christ. And we'll talk about that as we look in the video in just a moment. 
Uh, later popes, however, decided to include Jews as enemies of Christ. So the Crusader states and orders possessed diverse principalities along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Um, let me go ahead and uh, before I dive into that, I think it's important just to understand why the Crusades happened. What I'm going to do, I'm only going to show you a couple minutes of this because I, I want to make sure I have time for some questions at the end here. Um, but um, let me just show you just a few minutes of this crash course uh, video clip, just like one or two minutes. So you have kind of a rough understanding of what the Crusades were to begin with. And I'm sure you guys have heard of the Crusades before, but just to make sure we're all on the same page um, for a moment here. Let's start by saying that initially the Crusades were not a holy war on the part of Europeans against Islam, but in important ways, the Crusades were driven by religious faith. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, religion causes all wars. Imagine no- I'm gonna cut you off right there before you violate copyright me from the past, but as usual, you're wrong. Simple readings of history are rarely sufficient. By the way, when did my handwriting get so much better? I mean, if the Crusades had been brought on by the lightning fast rise of the Islamic empire and a desire to keep in Christian hands the land of Jesus, then they they would have started in the 8th century. But early Islamic dynasties like the Umayyads and the Abbasids were perfectly happy with Christians and Jews living among them as long as they paid a tax. And plus, the Christian pilgrimage business was awesome for the Islamic Empire's economy. But then a new group of Muslims, the Seljuk Turks, moved into the region and they sacked the holy cities and made it much more difficult for Christians to make their pilgrimages. And while they quickly realized their mistake, it was already too late. The Byzantines, who'd had their literal asses kicked at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, felt the threat and called upon the West for help. So the first official crusade began with a call to arms by Pope Urban II in 1095 CE. This was partly because Urban wanted to unite Europe and he'd figured out the lesson the rest of us learned from alien invasion movies. The best way to get people to unite is to give them a common enemy. So Urban called on all the bickering knights and nobility of Europe, and he saideth unto his people, let us go forth and help the Byzantines, because then maybe they will acknowledge my awesomeness and get rid of their stupid not having me as Pope thing. And while we're at it, let's liberate Jerusalem. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Shifting the focus to Jerusalem was really important because the Crusades were not primarily military operations. They were pilgrimages. Theologically, Christianity didn't have an idea of a holy war. Like, war might be just, but fighting wasn't something that got you into heaven. But pilgrimage to a holy shrine could help you out on that front, and Urban had the key insight to pitch the Crusade as a pilgrimage with a touch of warring on the side. I do the same thing to my kid every night. I'm not feeding you dinner featuring animal crackers. I'm feeding you animal crackers featuring dinner. Oh, it's time for the open letter. Okay, I'm gonna stop this for a moment. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with John Green, but he's hilarious and I love his uh, crash course clips. And I love that bit about, I'm not feeding you dinner featuring animal crackers. I'm feeding you animal crackers featuring dinner. I should try that with my uh, three daughters see if it works out. Anyway, um, what I wanted to just talk to you about briefly about the Crusades is the fact that um, there were uh, many different Crusades. And really, for our purposes, um, in order to go into more depth on them, we would need to um, have more time. I'm excited to talk through them with you. I think we might have to wait until next week because I do want to have a chance to uh, open up the floor for questions before we run out of time. Um, so this is actually a good stopping point because the Crusades are a great topic to dive into the next time uh, we meet if you if you choose to join uh, with our next webinar. So let me open up the floor here. Hi. Hi, Brandon. Hi, um, nice to hear you. And I have a question which is about in France, the Louis 13 or 14, I forgot, it was probably um, killed by the civilians uprising, but I really want to know why they uprising him. Sure, okay, so let's go back to France. Uh, this is, um, are you referring to Louis the ninth? Um, okay, no problem, that's okay. Well, that's an excellent question, and we can we can get into that uh, in more depth. But I just wanted to clarify: what king were you wondering about? Um, it's the first I thought part. It was the Louis the Fourteenth. Oh, Louis the Fourteenth. Oh, are you talking about uh, the Fronde? Yes. 
Ah, very good question. So we haven't quite gotten there yet in this um, in this course. So Louis the Fourteenth is going to rule from sixteen forty three to seventeen fifteen, and uh, we're really looking at you know the eleven hundreds and twelve hundreds. But that's a really good question. So the Fronde was one of the ways that the nobility had at that time in French history had tried to overthrow the king. And there's a lot that I can get into that we don't really have time for right now. But it's important to understand that in France, there's going to be constant fighting between the nobles and the king. Uh, the king, the kings of France, as someone mentioned in the chat pod earlier, didn't get the memo about uh, about a constitutional monarchy. They're going to maintain absolute power in France for as long as they possibly can. And so that's one of the reasons why Louis the 14th is going to have that issue, uh, actually, when he was pretty young um, as king. Great question, though. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks. Yes, I would love that. I would love to see you guys next time. Thank you guys for an awesome class. It was nice to have everyone here today. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all in my next webinar. Hey.